I think science should civilize people. Mm -hmm. Has it civilized people? Not clear to me at all. Right. But I, I, I suspect that, that, and that's one of the reasons why the engineers who were working at Xerox and other places were so, are so drawn to it, because science in some way or another is the hero, is the hero of in even humanizing people. And whereas in their normal lives, they get the experience of being an engineer, or a, especially a computer scientist is just totally nerd-like and, and unhuman, right. or inhuman. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so maybe that was part of the attraction of it. I don't, I don't well, know. I mean, there's clearly the idea that technology can transform society or does, I mean, it's a popular, it's, you know, yeah, it, it popularly we mistake technological transformation for so social transformation. So we recognize kind of social change through concrete technological change. Mm -hmm. In a movie we can recognize the year the car was made or yeah. whether they're using cell phones or trans transporters. Porter, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. I always figured you would be, there you go, I would have thought you would be a trekker. There you go. But well, I'm no, I'm not a trekker. I wasn't, but, but I did, and I actually I studied it very hard because um, you know, watched this all and tried to figure out what it was that was appealing because when I watched it, it seemed like a reasonably fascist, militarized society, right? That was going on these yeah. colonizing journ journeys to dominate. Um, <laughs> Even though there's that prime directive which says you're not supposed to interfere, r yes. interfere with other interfere. societies, although <laughs> the whole purpose of the show was talking about how the interference happened. Right, it? but it's, and it's very hierarchical, it's very military, you know, a militarized. Yeah. There's a captain who's always the hero, right? Yeah. Clearly these absurd scenarios developed by science fiction are actually much more often profoundly socially conservative, as we see in this kind of militarized yeah. hierarchical captain of, um, you know, a Star Trek enterprise, right? But we, but we do see. I mean, that was what I was really interested in. That that it does inflect, it does, you know. So it doesn't cause, it doesn't drive the technological change. It doesn't cause it. It doesn't even inspire it. But it's there. It was very present there at Star, at, at uh, Star Trek, mm -hmm. the Star Trek Enterprise in <laughs> Xerox <laughs> Park. And what it was being used for as the lingua franca, as the translation device between different disciplines who had no other language in common uh -huh. but this. So do you think that scientists use that, need that um, to, to, to function within their own environment? Uh, they need they translation devices. They need to talk to each other, or to talk. I mean, that's the interesting question. Um, or to, or to just work themselves. Do they need to translate what they're doing to themselves and their no, within a and, country? and between disciplines and between, and I think concrete things. Like Joan Fujimura did a great book on looking at how organic chemistry and biology created the um, molecular biology mm -hmm. department at at. Um, Berkeley, okay, and basically her claim was the same that that the um, it was the lab techniques they you know spoke totally different languages. Language, yeah, they had no no way to translate between the atomic spins yeah. that they were dealing with and the you know biological phenomena that they were dealing with. Yeah. But but it was the lab techniques and people beside each other working and figuring out what techniques could be used to represent something else that kind of were the translation device around which they said, well, we would call this this and we would call yeah. that that. And, and that's, I think... It's probably true when you come into new areas of science that, that people need that. I mean, I, it's, I think what you're saying now is just in microcosm of what's... The 21st century, the, the boundaries between physics and biology in particular They've already vanished a lot between physics and chemistry, but between physics and biology are really going to vanish in the sense that the biologists have been using the techniques of physics mm -hmm. a lot. But I remember when I was a graduate student and I got depressed, which I often did when I was a graduate student, um, and I wanted to quit physics many times. And I thought of going to do a PhD MD program in, in Boston. And I remember speaking to a a relative of a, of, a, of a friend of mine who was a chair of a, of a biology department at, at Harvard. And, um, and he said, no, don't do biophysics because that's a field that's not of interest to biologists or physicists. <laughs> the stuff in there, you know, is, is not of interest either. And that was probably true in, in, um, in the late 70s, early 80s. But, the, but the, the thing that's really different now, and the reason they have to communicate, and the reason it's difficult because of these disciplinary departments that don't reflect the emerging research, which is 
cross-disciplinary, is the fact that now it's not just the techniques of science, physics, that are being used in biology. The biological systems are themselves becoming interesting to physicists. Mm -hmm. uh, molecular motors are now interesting. The question is, are there new physical systems in biology that you can study as a physicist? You don't give a damn about the, about the biology necessarily, but hey, this is a neat little object, a physical object. Are there new l laws that guide how that either is created or, or functions that don't exist in, in organic systems or uh, non-biological systems. And so the questions, not only the techniques the same, are, are the same, but the questions are becoming of interest. And when that happens, then the two disciplines really will merge. But I hadn't thought of, it is extremely difficult to think how to translate. I'm glad to he hear you say that I think you have to find techniques that are not always visual. Right. But, but to, um, to explain both to yourself as a scientist and to your colleagues what's interesting about what you're doing. Again, it comes back to this idea of seducing. Into other, why would you get a biologist? I know, I'm, I, know I shouldn't you're talk. Right. I'm, you know, seduction, what can I say? But, uh, you're really uh, into seduction. Yeah, well, because I think it, uh, for better or worse, describes a lot of what we do in our lives, right? Is, it, um, it's a very romantic view, I think. But, it, but it, it is effectively what you're doing. when you Because persuasion is really, I mean, if it's effective, right. it's really seduction. Right? I mean, it's because what you're, when you're really persuading someone, what you're really doing is, is convincing them to think what you want them to think, but be happy about it. <laughs> Instead of all forcing right, them. Right. <laughs> and, and, but, uh, but let's, so let's agree. And kind of, it's, a, it's, a strat it's a persuasive strategy. Yeah, right? okay, I'll, I'll call it a persuasive right. strategy if it's better, okay. better, but I'll have to change, get used to that. But um, uh, I was, remember I was on a visiting committee at MIT, and, and, and the real thing is they, these students tend to think they're going to be successful because they're, they're good at what they're doing. But in fact, a large barometer of their success will be how well they can communicate what they're doing. Because we spend very little time educating our students on how to communicate. Mm -hmm. because, and the students got the message, I remember at MIT, the big problem was, so we force them to take you know, English or we force them to take writing. But it's always taught by someone that they don't view as a role model, someone they care about. It's always sort of something we call them B and, oh, I have to take this course. But the people I really view as my mentors, people I I, I really admire, they're not teaching this stuff, so it's, it's not worth it. So you have to bring the communication into the, into the classes, into the engineering courses, into the physics classes, so the students see that it's, it, it's important and has some value. But, it's, but the strategy of persuasion, I think, is vitally important within the field. I'm not, and I should be very clear about this, I, I, while I understand science as a sociological phenomenon, I do th believe in objective reality, and I do believe that ultimately important science wins out in spite of the, the social constructs and the social pressures to do, or peer pressures to do certain things. So I think that ultimately people realize what's significant without, and would have ultimately realize what was significant even if it takes a lo little a bit longer if you don't present it well. I don't think it's all persuasion and I don't, and maybe, maybe good, maybe we can find something we disagree about. Uh, but, because uh, uh, I, I really do, um, Professionally, you have to believe that. No, I, uh, maybe, no, I, I, I don't need to, need to anymore, I suppose. It's true, I happen to, as a scientist, and in particular someone who tries to, for better or worse, extol the virtues of science and a society doesn't appreciate many of those virtues. The vir one of the virtues of science, I really do think, is that, that ultimately the good stuff wins out, even if it takes a while to do it, because the ultimate arbiter of success isn't people in science, I think. It's experiments. It's the ability to, be, to make it work. If it works, then people buy into it, whether or not they like it or not. And I really think that's profoundly important. That and the other fact, which we we're getting at at the beginning, which is this notion that science doesn't prove things to be true. That's such a, a misunderstanding. Science only proves things to be false. That's all it does. But but that alone is something that doesn't happen in almost any other area of, of human activity. The fact that you can say, that's garbage, don't talk about it anymore. The Earth isn't flat. We don't need to have critical thinking classes where we, we debate and discuss if the Earth is flat. You just go around it, end of story. And the ability to throw out ideas that aren't productive is what's, what makes science unique and what, makes, what allows for progress is that you don't have to keep wasting your time on the wrong things because the wrong things are obvious. The right things may not be obvious, but the wrong things should be obvious. Well, I, it's interesting that you would have been to see me as a relativist, which is, as 
fine. I'm well, I don't know, but I was kind of hoping you, I could provoke that. 